Well, one more time, welcome. I'm so glad that you guys are joining us today here at River of Life. And a special welcome to all of our Facebook family that are joining us right now. We are excited for uh, the series that we're in, talking about hope. And I don't know about you, but in the midst of everything that we've been going through, hope feels like something distant. But I believe it's something that we need to be believing for today. It's something that we need to be expecting to receive more of as we get closer. I mean, it doesn't matter how crazy the world gets. We have a hope that is greater. And so last week, we took some time and we talked about hope for the weary and what it means to actually be people who live in light of Jesus' command for rest. I hope you've had some good time of rest this week and some time to reflect what it is to be a people who take Jesus at his word about that. And so today, uh, we're going to continue that theme. But before I do that I recognize that sometimes the thing that makes us weary is all the different hats that we have to wear. Like, I I don't know how many different roles that you play, but I I have quite a few. I'm I'm the pastor here in case, again, you haven't met, my name is Gerald. I'm the pastor around these parts. And so um, I'm pastor, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a dad, or I, well, I guess that's the same thing, isn't it? Um, but um, I'm, I'm taking care of my mom who's going through some uh, dementia issues. So I'm, I'm a son and a caregiver. Uh, there's, you know, just different things like that. But to my kids, probably one of the most important roles that I play is I am a toy fixer. Like, that's just, that's just my role. One of the, we actually have this drawer, and I probably shouldn't even admit this because I can probably go there right now and there's too many toys in there right now, but we have this little drawer that I use that my kids will put their toys in, and I know that, okay, if there's toys in there, I'm supposed to fix them. And so, uh, like I said, I, I apologize, Winnie, Silas, uh, there, there's probably a few things I haven't gotten to in a while, but, but they're in there, and it's just, it's something we do. Actually, uh, recently, we had gotten some stuff uh, from my stepdad that had been kind of put away in storage, and I've been cleaning them up and, and getting them, and I ended up coming across this uh, toy from my childhood. Actually, it was my best friend from fourth grade. It was his toy, and he ended up leaving it behind when he moved, and so I took meticulous care of it, and it got put in a box and then forgotten, and so I found it. I cleaned it up. I sent him this picture. I'm like, hey, do you want this back? And, and, and he was like, well, actually, I think statute of limitations, it's yours. Uh, but he's like, if you ever throw it away, please, please uh, send it my direction. But yeah, so like, uh, we, I take care of toys. That, that's one of my, my many jobs. And, and that's just it. They get broken and, and you find ways to reconnect them. Well, today, I want to talk about someone who's really good at fixing things. His name's Jesus. And we want to look about the fact that there is hope for the broken. That there, there's hope for the broken parts of our lives. And, and we can take things to him and he won't put them in a closet or put them in a, in a drawer and get back to them later. He, he's ready to deal with things right now. And so that's really the big thing. And, and one of the major issues that we have to wrestle with and we have to recognize is part of our brokenness comes from our own bad decisions. That the things we do often contribute to the brokenness. And sometimes it's the things that other people do as well. But, but that's a major source. And, and when our sin, when our brokenness gets exposed, it, it breeds panic in us. It breeds a sense of, oh, can I, can I even go on? But the truth is that when Jesus allows us to walk through those times, it's for a reason. And he, he's wanting to do something in us. He, he wants us to bring his sin, our sin. He wants us to bring our brokenness to him because he, again, is the only one who has the ability to speak into it. And so the thing is, as the church, we need to be a people who are easy to come to, easy to extend grace and extend hope for, for broken people. As we talk about this this morning, I also want to bring a part of the gospel that's kind of broken. I, I shared this passage back in April, and it's a passage that Jesus uses to kind of confront the religious systems that are around him. And uh, when we... When I shared it back in April, I really focused on the religious leaders and I realized I never really talked that much about the woman in this story. And I feel like it's, we, we need to take some time and look at that. When, when we looked at it last time, 
I helped us understand that one of the difficulties with this story is we don't know whether or not John actually ever wrote it. We find it in the Gospel of John, but we're not sure that John was the author. And so it's a portion of Scripture that has found its way in through tradition, but it wasn't a part of the original manuscripts as they've come to light. And so the question is, is it a real story or is it not? One of the things that I want to say that points to the fact that it probably was a real story is there were a lot of fake stories about Jesus when the Gospels were being written. And especially a few years after the Gospels were written, a lot of fake stories came out. Weird stories like the cross talking to people and stories about Jesus making animals out of mud and then breathing life into them and they came alive and started walking around when he was a little kid. I mean, just, just weird stuff like that. This story doesn't have any of that fantastical stuff. As a matter of fact, this story only reinforces everything we already know about Christ. And so I believe it's a real story. And I, I'd, whether John wrote it or not, it was handed down through the ages and preserved because it speaks to this powerful part of who Jesus is. He's someone who restores. He's someone who brings hope to broken people. And he expects the people who follow him to do the same. And I really believe that is captured in this story. And so we're going to read John chapter 8 and look at the story of the woman caught in adultery. And I would encourage you to go ahead and stand with me for the reading of God's Word. If you're on Facebook, uh, please stand if you can. If you're driving, please stay seated. Uh, But uh, for all of us who can and are able, let's go ahead and stand in reverence to God's Word as we read it today out of the New Living Translation. So John 3, sorry, John 8, verses 3 through 8. And this is how it reads out of the New Living. As Jesus was speaking, the teachers of religious law and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again. All right. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. Let's pray. Jesus, we do thank you for today. We thank you that you are the healer of our brokenness. And I pray that this passage would resonate with us today that we would recognize that we can turn to you with everything that we have. Our good days, our bad days, the times in which we miss the mark. And you bring healing. I pray that as the church, we would recognize it is our job to dispense that hope. The hope for the broken. That we wouldn't stand in judgment, but we'd stand in open arms, inviting people to receive all that is offered through the cross of Jesus Christ. Make your word come alive to us today. Holy Spirit, illuminate it. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. Well, before you see it, why don't you wave to a person or two, let them know you're excited to be worshiping with them today, and uh, you can find your seats. So, thank you, Mark. Uh, so, as we're looking at this passage, a couple of things jump out to me. Uh, Last week, we talked about how everyone experiences some weariness. The thing that I see in this passage is that everyone has brokenness. That that is is a, a common thing that all of us have. There's not a person in this room that hasn't experienced some level of brokenness. Again, whether it's the decisions you've made or the decisions that have been made against you, we, we have all walked through seasons where we feel less than. We feel that we are inferior. And, and we have to wrestle with that. One of the things that I love about the church is that this is never an area that we try to hide. Unlike many other religions or many other thoughts out there, we are not basically good. We, we all 
come to this thing with a sense of brokenness. And I believe Christianity is the only religion that addresses that head on. That actually says, we are the ones that are causing the pain in the world around us. But we also have an ability to come to a God who will forgive us, who will heal us, and will help us to move beyond that. And so today, as we're looking at this, we need to see everyone has brokenness. In the story, we see a woman who was brought in because of her brokenness. In verse 3, it says, the teachers of religious law brought this woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They, they brought her because she was caught. And that, that sense of being caught shows her brokenness. Not only was she caught doing something that was against the law or against the religious moral code of their day, it also meant that she was caught in a broken relationship. We don't know if she was married or the person that she was having the affair with was married, but in either case, relationship had been broken through this act. It also points to a broken system because they're bringing this woman in front of Jesus and there should have been a second person there. It's hard to commit the act of adultery without two people. And so the system was broken that she was being punished, but the other person was being hidden. But we also see not only was she broken, not only was the relationship broken, not only was the system broken, I believe the religious leaders were broken too. In verse 6, you see, they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. These are the people that were supposed to know the Bible. These are the people who were instructed from childhood what the Scriptures say. These are the ones that should have been looking for the Messiah. And when Jesus, their Messiah, was standing in front of them, rather than trying to learn from Him, rather than trying to figure out, does He line up with the criteria? They were fixed on trying to trap Him. Trying, trying to put their net not only around this woman, but around Him. And so they were revealing their own brokenness. That they were not willing to use the very Word of God that they had access to, to study, to figure out who Jesus was. I mean, obviously there were some. We, we read about two different members of the religious order in Nicodemus and Joseph who were part of the Sanhedrin and they were kind of closet disciples of Jesus. But most of them didn't want anything to do with it. Most of them wanted to show the people that he wasn't really the Messiah, and so they were trying to trap him. So it speaks to the fact that the religious and the irreligious were all broken. But the other thing that I see in this story is that the church offers hope. That even though there was brokenness, the church offers hope. And the hard part about this is that when we bring our brokenness, it doesn't feel good. Or when our sin gets exposed, it's not fun. But what I hope we understand through this is that when we either are exposed or we allow ourselves to come and boldly confess to Christ, it's actually restorative. One of my favorite things growing up in South Dakota, and you can probably can relate here in Wisconsin, was when they would call a snow day. I mean, in South Dakota, and around here I'm noticing too, we're kind of rugged. We don't do it as often as most of the kids would like. But, but when we got a snow day, that was a big deal. Like we would go out and we would go and just, we'd spend all day until we were called back into the house. We'd be out playing, building snow forts, you know, doing all sorts of crazy stuff, you know, and, and by, by the time my day was done, my hands were frozen. Like they were just, you know, a box of ice. And it didn't matter how good my gloves were. Like I'd usually lose one or two on the, uh, while I was out playing anyway. So like my hands would come in frozen and either one or two things would happen. I'd either go and stand in front of our little propane heater that we had in the house, or I would get a cup of hot chocolate. And, you know, I'd put my hands around that hot chocolate. And I'm sure all of you have experienced that. Initially, when you do that, your hands just explode. 
like all of this sensation starts coming back and it's painful and it hurts and it, and it doesn't feel like it's the right thing to happen. But we all know what is happening is they're coming alive again. The blood is beginning to flow again. You're, you're staving off frostbite. These are all good things. And as you do that, it, it's a restorative. It doesn't feel like it at the moment, but it's restorative. I really like what Pastor Stephen Furtick had to say about when we bring our sin, because it's the same thing. At first, when we bring our sin, it feels painful. It feels like we're broken. It feels like we will never be whole again. But what Pastor Furtick says is, God exposes sin not to shame us, but to change us. God exposes sin not to shame us, but to change us. And that's powerful. Because we know we can come to God and it may feel uncomfortable, but it's going to bring healing and restoration. If we keep reading the story, we see that's exactly where Jesus takes it. In verses 9 and 10, the author continues. He says, when the accusers heard this, that if they had no sin, that they got to throw the first stone, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to her, said to the woman, where are your accusers? Don't even one of them condemn you? The thing is, when we bring it to Christ, He's not there to condemn. He's there to heal. And I hope, though we don't have proof, I hope his disciples were in the background taking note. Because they could have been just as easy swayed by the religious leaders looking at this woman, thinking that she should be made to be punished for her crime. But I hope that the people who are following closest, the people who would create the church, were taking note. Matter of fact, I think they were. I think that's why we still have this story. Because they were recognizing when broken people come into our midst, we're not there to condemn. We're not there to accuse. We're there to bring people to Jesus. And that's why the church offers hope. That's why we can say that this is a place where we offer restoration. And I'll be the first to admit, we don't do this well sometimes. And if you've ever walked into a church and felt condemnation and felt accusation and felt like the people around you were, rather than bringing you closer to Jesus, were bringing you closer towards being pushed out and being punished, if that's you, can I just say on behalf of the church, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the way the church has hurt you in the past. That's not what we are designed for. And so as people here at this church, I pray that we would be people who offer hope. That we don't judge people, we don't, we don't attack people for their brokenness, but we offer Jesus. And the one thing that we see in this story and throughout the gospel is that when we bring our brokenness and when the church offers hope, Jesus restores purpose. That, that when we can bring all these things to Him and place them in His hands, He has the ability to take those broken pieces, the pieces that look like they would never fit back together, and find renewed purpose and renewed mission for our lives. Continuing the story, starting back at verse 10, we just read this, but Jesus said, stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Don't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. He's saying, I don't condemn you, but what I'm calling you to is to live differently now. He doesn't deny the fact that she had sinned. He doesn't deny the fact that she had done something that was horrible in the eyes of the law. But he says, I'm not going to accuse you. Instead, go 
and change the way you live. Go and offer other people this restoration. And that's the way we should be. That's how we should live our lives as people who are being restored and then going and offer restoration to other people. I don't know how many of you like circuses. Uh, we, we really tried to get out to them a lot when my kids were, were younger. And you know, one, one of my favorite parts of it were the trapeze artists. These people who had the ability to seemingly fly through the air and they would be you know, just doing these amazing tricks and you know, catching each other and catching the, the bars as they flew by. And I mean, it was just amazing things. And um, I've seen a few of them do it without a net, but, but that's just not very wise, I guess. Uh, and luckily, I've never seen someone mess up with that. But, but oftentimes, you'll see the net. And I've even seen some mess up while they've had the net. But the amazing thing is, like, I've noticed how some of them can learn how to just, even if they fall, they have an ability to hit that net and jump right back up and get right into the middle of the show. Actually, I watched one show where they incorporated the net, where they were constantly falling and jumping back up and falling and jumping back up. And it was pretty amazing to watch. I think this is what the church is supposed to be. We are not going to get it right all the time. Matter of fact, we probably are going to miss daily. There's probably some part of our life that we can look at and say, I missed it right there. But rather than allowing that to sideline us, what if we became really good at placing that in Christ's hands immediately, or at least before the sun goes down? You say, God, I'm sorry that I messed up here. And the world gets to watch us fall and bounce back up and fall and bounce back up and, and be in astonishment of how much we are able to go through because we have a God who catches us every time. I mean, that Jesus is our safety net. That's the beautiful part. Jesus is our safety net. And, and He will help to bounce us back into restoration. He will help us to get back into what He has called us to, back to the purpose. But how terrible would it be if you ever went to a circus and all you saw them do was to just sit in that net and, and, and lay down and you just saw you know, 10 trapeze artists and they were just taking a nap in the net. That's the church. Maybe not our church, but that's the church that I see around our country. People who have found Jesus as a safety net and they just curl there. And they love the hope that they've been given, but they don't actually bounce back in to the purpose for which the net was placed there. We weren't given Jesus just so that we could be saved. We were given Jesus so that we could enter into His work of redemption that we can offer other people a hand up, that we can show other people where the net is so that when they fall, they don't have to be broken. We need to be a people who don't fall asleep on the net, that we actively engage what we've been given so that we can take this message to more and more people. And that's one of the reasons why I really want to emphasize our lifeguards group, that this is something where we're trying to develop a community around this concept of discipleship, around this concept that we can be helping each other out. We want to be people who pour through the Scripture together. We want to be people who pray for non-believers so that people who are far from God have that opportunity. And we look for the opportunity to be that hand outstretched. That we are people who practice hospitality, that we invite people into our lives on purpose both people inside this church and people outside of the church, that we're looking to share our lives together and that we pursue accountability, that we choose to say, I'm not just going to believe this, I'm going to ask other people to hold me accountable for how I'm living this. So that's what this is all about. And so if you weren't here last Sunday uh, and you're here today and you're interested in this, I really want to encourage you to sign up to be a part of our, life group, our lifeguards group. It's 
we have a Facebook community going, and we also have information in case you don't want to follow it on Facebook. Uh, we, we've got information for that. And so it's really simple to sign up. You can go to riveroflife.co forward slash follow, and that will take you to our Facebook page. Or if you don't want to use the Facebook option, you can just text the word follow to our, our special text number, the 715-953-4060. And by filling that out, we'll get you in a queue and we'll make sure that anything we put out on the Facebook community will go out to you as well. And, and we want to, we're going to be developing through the next month or so ways in which we can be pouring over Scripture together, ways in which we can be praying for non-believers, ways in which we can be practicing hospitality, and then hopefully putting us together in groups where we can hold each other accountable so that we're actually living the life that Jesus called us to be. We're actually being the hope. Because what's going on right now in the world is beyond divisive. I don't know if you can feel it. I don't know if you can see it. I don't, I don't know how you cannot, I guess, is maybe a better question. But what if this was the hour that the church rose up? That we stopped being so concerned about being entertained on Sundays and more concerned with how we're using Sundays to empower us to go out. Nothing wrong with having great worship. Nothing wrong with having a great speaker. I hope I fill that bill. But at the end of the day, it's more about what we're doing when we leave here. It's more about how we're living differently so the world sees the net that we have, so that the world comes in contact with Christ, so that the world has the opportunity to be restored and be bounced back into what God has for them. Let's be people who are passionate about bringing broken people to Christ and that we practice as a church the ability to say, we're going we're gonna to be restorative. We're going we're gonna to say, this is how we allow people to come back in. This is, this, this is a place where it's safe for you if you've been hurt. It's safe for you if you're hurting. That's what we need to be. That's how we need to live. And I really want to encourage you. So again, either jump on our Facebook group. You can find us on Facebook if you're on Facebook. Or again, you can do that link and it'll take you directly to our lifeguard group where you can sign up and we'll get you plugged in. Or text the word follow and we'll get you plugged in that way. And if you heard nothing else, if, you, if you've tuned out, this is the time to come back in. I, I've heard it said like in every message, every 45 seconds, people are either tuned in or they're tuned out. And every 45 seconds, people are coming in and out. So let this be the 45 seconds you tune back in for, uh, for just a, a, a few seconds because this is what I really want you to grab a hold of. Offer your brokenness to Christ. If you're broken, Bring it to Him. Expose it to Him because He wants to bring healing. And then, let's be a people who extend grace to the broken in our lives. That we don't hold people at distance because they're broken, but we, we bring them in. We allow them to have restoration and we say, welcome to the family of God. So with that, I want to offer that this morning too. You might be here in this room or you might be online and connecting with us and maybe you don't know Christ. I want to give everyone the opportunity to know Him and to feel the forgiveness that He offers. And He says it's simple. All we got to do is simply believe He is who He said He was. That we have to believe that God rose Him from the dead. And that we have to turn to Him and ask Him to be our Lord. And by doing that, turning away from our old lives. And so, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And if that's you, please pray this with me. You can pray it out loud. You can pray it in your heart. You can use my words. You can use your own words. Why don't, why don't we why don't just take a moment of reverence as we offer this to people who need restoration. Pray something like this. Say, Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you died for me. And I believe that God rose you from the dead. Forgive me for my brokenness. For my sin. 
for the ways in which I haven't lived up to my own standard or even the standard that you have set. Today, I turn away from my old life and I choose to follow you. Holy Spirit, fill me. Give me the strength I need to live for Jesus every day. God, I thank you for this new life. From this day forward, you have all of mine. As I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, please come talk with me after service. I'd love to be connected. If you're online, uh, jump in the and message us, send us an email, do something, let us know that you made that. We want to make sure you get the resources you need to be able to live a life that follows after Christ. And for the rest of us, let's take some time today and offer our brokenness to Him. Most, again, a lot of our prayer team is out today. Um, and I do see Mark back there, so I think Mark would be willing to pray with you if you needed prayer. But maybe you just need to find one of these empty seats or or right where you're at and and take some time and confess your brokenness to Christ as we sing one more song. But then let's leave this place looking for opportunity to share this truth with other people, to let people know there's hope because that's why we were created. So I'm going to bless us. Why don't we stand? We're going to sing one more song and then You guys are are free to be conduits of hope to our world. So let let me bless us as we sing this last song and, and prepare to enter into our mission. Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you that we can come to you with our brokenness. And I pray that we wouldn't try to hide it. You've already seen it. But that we would come to you, allow you to cleanse us, allow you to heal us. And that we would go out passionate to offer that same level of forgiveness, that same level of grace to the world around us. And as we go, I pray that you would bless us and you would protect us. Jesus, I pray that you'd be gracious toward us and smile upon us. And that every day we would walk in your favor and in your peace. As we pray this all, in your powerful name. Amen. Amen. Let's let the cross have the final word.